and welcome to Diabetes Connections in the News. I'm Stacey Sims, and these are the top diabetes stories and headlines of the past seven days. In the News is brought to you by the T1D Exchange. T1D Exchange is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving outcomes for the entire T1D population. And by my new book, Still the World's Worst Diabetes Mom, More Real-Life Stories of Parenting a Child with Type 1 Diabetes, available on Amazon in paperback and for Kindle. Our top story this week, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approves teplizumab, the first drug to delay the onset of type 1 diabetes. We've been following this for a long time, and I will link up our previous interviews with Provention Bio, the company that makes it. The brand name will be t and it's an injection to delay the onset of stage 3 type 1 diabetes in adults and in kids 8 years and older who have stage 2 type 1 diabetes. Those stages are different, right? We're not used to talking about diabetes in those terms. So I have a lot of questions. We will follow up with an interview and a lot more information as soon as I can. Uh, t zealed is administered by intravenous infusion once daily for 14 consecutive days. So this is not something that, as far as I know, you can do at home. It's a little bit more complicated than some of the headlines had made it sound, but in my opinion, extremely hopeful. The other big story this week, and honestly, this is my lead story until t Zealed was approved late Thursday night, and that is the kerfuffle over on Twitter, where a couple of accounts spoofed Eli Lilly. The insulin maker's stock tanked 6% over just one day late last week, wiping billions of dollars from its market cap. Here's what happened. On November 10th, someone pretending to be Lilly's corporate account tweeted, quote, we are excited to announce insulin is free now. Twitter, under new owner Elon Musk, was verifying any account with any name for just $8. Another verified but fake Lily account tweeted profanities and taunted people who use insulin with higher pricing. Again, also fake. Other major insulin makers, Sanofi and Novo Nordisk, got caught up in the crossfire. Their stock prices dropped. And of course, questions over the high cost of insulin got back in the headlines. In the understatement of the year, on Thursday of this week, Lilly CEO David Ricks said, quote, it probably highlights that we have more work to do to bring down the cost of insulin for more people, end quote. Mice with diabetes appeared cured after transplantation of insulin-secreting pancreatic islet cells, according to a Stanford Medicine study. The animal's immune systems were coaxed, they say, to accept the donated cells prior to transplantation through a three-pronged process that could, quote, be easily replicated in humans, the researchers said. No immune-suppressing treatments were necessary after the transplant. This is a very new technique, and the difference here, it's very complicated, but put simply, is that they do two transplants. First, a partial blood stem cell transplant, which makes the new pancreas cells recognized as the body's own and less likely to be rejected. Long way to go here, but a promising idea. New study on full pancreas transplants. These researchers say up to 90% of people who received a pancreas transplant enjoy freedom from insulin therapy and the need for close glucose monitoring. Biggest drawback is having to take immunosuppressants for the rest of their life. The number of pancreas transplants has gone down in recent years. A new paper this week in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism says this isn't a long-term cure. The median graft survival is about eight years, and the transplanted pancreas does not always work well, so the patient might not be completely insulin-free. However, the researchers do say that the combined kidney-pancreas transplant should be considered for all patients with type 1 with an indication for a kidney transplant. The first and only seven-day infusion set is ready to go. After approval more than a year ago, in September of 2021, Medtronic says U.S. customers can now order the Medtronic Extended for the 600 and 700 series pumps. The extended wear set is estimated to result in an annual cost savings of insulin of up to 25% due to a reduced number of set and reservoir changes that result in what they call unrecoverable insulin, as well as plastic waste reduction of up to 50%. Medtronic is sending emails out regarding CareLink software outages. And thanks to you listeners who sent me this. We are not Medtronic customers, so I did not get this. They say that uh, most customers, they were able to resolve the issue very quickly through an app fix. 
You had to log out and log back into CareLink. You can try that if you haven't done that yet. But they say they know it didn't work for everybody. And they say Medtronic is still working to resolve the issue for some customers. They also say this was not because of a security breach, but they didn't give further details. There's a recall for Omnipod. This is an issue with the Omnipod 5 controller, charging port, and cable. This does not impact the Omnipod 5 pod, the Omnipod Dash system, or the Android smartphone devices with the Omnipod 5 app. Now, no serious injuries have been reported, but Insulet has received reports that the Omnipod 5 controller charging port or cable is discoloring or even melting due to excess heat. Customers are instructed to call them or log into an FDA site. I will link up all of the information, the phone number, and the website in the show notes at diabetes-connections.com. This was a voluntary recall. They were not ordered to do so by the FDA. Small study shows that using the Dexcom G7 is easier for older adults to insert and use. This was a small but pretty interesting study. They recruited 10 people over the age of 65 with no prior CGM experience, and 10 diabetes educators took part as well. They reported that the G7 required half as many steps to set up and deploy as the G6 system. And the survey scores were 92.8, which investigators say was reflective of an excellent usability rating. Control IQ for people with type 2 works well and is safe. New study from Tandem Diabetes Care shows people with type 2 spent 3.6 3.6 hours a day longer in the target range after switching to the t X2 pump Dexcom system from multiple daily injections or basal insulin only. New program from Walgreens to help give more people access to information and diabetes services. Walgreens is teaming up with its health corners and third-party clinics to offer free A1C and blood glucose testing and diabetes education during this Diabetes Awareness Month. For participating locations, go to walgreens.com slash free diabetes screening, and I will link that up. Interestingly, Walgreens says they are the largest provider of CGMs, including the Dexcom G6 and Freestyle Libre 2. Very large study out of China says sleeping in a room exposed to outdoor artificial light at night may increase the risk of developing diabetes. 100,000 Chinese adults were in this study, and they found that people who lived in areas of China with high light pollution at nighttime were about 28% more likely to develop diabetes than people who lived in the least polluted areas. I told you about a study published earlier this year that showed sleeping for only one night with a dim light, like a TV set with the sound off, raises blood sugar and heart rates of young people during that sleep lab experiment. But these researchers in China caution Any direct link between diabetes and nighttime light pollution is still unclear because just living in an urban area itself is a known contributor to the development of diabetes. New study says women with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, were found to be at a higher risk for developing type 2 over a 30-year period. One study estimated that nearly one in five adolescent girls with type 2 also has PCOS. The nature of the link, though, is not fully understood. There is evidence that correcting the hormone imbalances seen in PCOS may reduce the risk of developing type 2. A different study showed that taking oral birth control pills as a treatment for PCOS reduced the risk for type 2 diabetes. Back to the news in just a moment, but first let me tell you about the T1D exchange. I've been telling you about this for a while. Your personal information remains confidential, and I really urge you to sign up. T1D Exchange Registry is a research study conducted online. And the platform is open to adults and kids with type 1 living in the United States. There's a great article on their website right now all about this, like a deep dive with the team behind the registry about how it works and why you should do it. And one of the things that they point out, which I'm not sure I've mentioned, is that their research study is longitudinal. So that means they follow people over time. And that allows them to understand the progression of type 1 and how management needs to change year to year. You can look for whatever research opportunity really appeals to you. But by sharing your opinions and your experience and your data, you can advance meaningful treatment, care, and policy. This stuff really matters and makes a difference. Please check it out. Go to t1dregistry.org slash Stacey. That is t1dregistry.org slash S-T-A-C-E-Y. This week marks the Fall 2022 Diabetes Mine Innovation Days. I've been lucky enough to attend this conference in the past, and it really is a glimpse into the future. They say uh, it connects leaders and innovators taking diabetes care to the next level. And of course, you know, there's the patient community there. 
But what I always look for, and I know many of you who listen to as well, is like, what is coming next? Who is presenting? What technology should we be looking out for? And I'll be reaching out to some of the folks who are presenting, you know, to see what we can learn from them. So those will be some podcast episodes, hopefully in the weeks and months to come. On the podcast next week, an in-depth discussion with my daughter. It's my son who has type one, but he has an older sister. I have a daughter named Leah. And we did a long interview about what it's like to be a sibling of a child with type 1 diabetes. She was five when her brother was diagnosed. She recently turned 21. She has a lot to say about this subject. And I got to tell you, I don't think we solve anything, but I think there's some really good advice through our experiences for families, you know, that are going through something similar. So I'm really, I'm proud of her that she did that. And it's, uh, I'm excited to bring it to you. And last week's episode was all about ever since E3 and the future of long-term continuous glucose monitoring. That's the CGM that stays under the skin for six months. And what is next from that company? You can listen wherever you get your podcasts. There will be no in the news next week because of Thanksgiving. There will be a regular episode, like I said, my interview with Leah. And that is it for in the news this week. If you like it, please share it. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you back here soon. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.